Till the stars lose their glory Yours till the birds fail to sing Yours to the end of life's story This pledge to you Yours in the grave of December Here or on far distant shores I've never loved anyone the way I love you How When I was born to be just yours. The program we did on Vera Lynn was, according to my mother, the very best program we'd ever made. It's wonderful when a natural voice is as good as that. Trained voices are in leagues of their own, and they are quite marvellous artefacts. But when the natural voice comes out in popular music like, say, Presley, or Vera Lynn and many others, there's a thrill to it and there's, it's actually, there's a, a sort of genuineness about it that, if it's good enough, gives it a resonance that nothing else can bring, I think. And she had this wonderful natural voice. She was also very musically blessed in a quiet way. Benny Green on the programme, who knew an awful lot about music, said that she would have been a success without the war. <laughs> well, the war made her. We'll Meet Again and the White Cliffs of Dover became wonderful, not only records, but records of the way the British felt about themselves in the Second World War. We wanted to be like that. We wanted to be easygoing and tolerant, but not giving in, and decent and keeping going, and looking after people we cared for. We wanted to be like that. And she endorsed that point of view for us with these lovely songs coming out. We'll Meet Again. I can sing it now, but don't worry. <laughs> White Cliffs of Dover, and she can be said to have captured a nation's hearts, which is not a small thing to do. She was born Vera Welsh 74 years ago in the East End of London. Her mother was a dressmaker, her father a plumber's mate. He was also MC for the East Ham Working Men's Club. He recognised the talent in his daughter and put her on to sing when she was seven. People said I could sing, so I sang. And, uh... We, we went to the clubs and everyone, yes, said, yes, come back and do another show at some other time. And it was just a matter of routine, really. You, you didn't go into depth and think about things and analyse things. I think I've been a bit like that all my life. You know, people talk about things, you know, going so deep and, and, and I want to find myself. I don't know what they're talking about because what I've done, I, I've just done gradually all over the years, and um, and I suppose it's just sort of come naturally to me. Up the wooden hill to Bedford Chill, heading for the land of dreams. When I look back. By the time she was 11, she was on her way to every schoolgirl's dream of stardom. She took her grandmother's maiden name and became Vera Lynn. She was earning big money, seven and six for three songs and one and six for an encore. She left school at 14, lasted one day sewing buttons in a clothing factory and reminded her parents that she could earn more from one concert than sewing could bring home in a month. Although she couldn't read music, she knew what she sang best. At 16, she was already well known in Tin Pan Alley. My longest uh, touring spot was a week and a half with Billy Cotton. And he sent me home after the second week. He used to announce to me as a young amateur singer that he'd heard singing somewhere. And what used to annoy him was that I used to walk on the stage full of bounce, you see, very professional, because by this time I'd had 10 years of, of working. And um, 
I, I wasn't sort of, uh, I was too professional looking, I think, for what, for what he wanted at that time. But uh, I, I don't know, he, he tried to change my dress style, as everybody's always tried to do, and <laughs> try and change everything. But uh, I think basically it was really because he didn't want to travel around with a young girl singer on her own. Not long after leaving Billy Cotton, Vera Lynn started singing with the Charlie Coons dance band. I suppose it was glamorous to me when I started broadcasting from the West End theatres and the, and the uh, restaurants, the nightclubs and things. And Charlie Coons onwards, he was in the Kasani Club in Regent Street. And that was very big time, you know. Uh, all these posh ladies and gentlemen sitting around in full evening dress. In those days, you weren't allowed anywhere in unless you were properly dressed. And um, doing the broadcasts from there. Uh, it looked, and there was me, uh, when it was finished, I would, the glamour finished. I'd put on my cloth coat, go outside and stand in the bus queue for the 15 bus <laughs> and go home to East Ham. I don't think at that time I had any great visions of a, of, of a career. Just later on, when I started singing with dance bands, um, I thought, well, yes, I'm going to be, I'm going to be one of the best dance band singers there is. I could never sing in the, the keys that the, uh, the printed copy was in. It always had to be transposed down. My voice has always sounded higher than it actually is. I can follow the music in as much as when the notes go up, I go up, and when they go down, I go down. But I think it's a, more or less a matter of, of guessing, intuition, if you like, how a tune should go, and invariably that's the way it goes. As Chamberlain promised peace and Hitler prepared for war, Vera had become what she'd always wanted to be, one of the best band singers. By 1939, she was singing with the Ambrose Orchestra. When war broke out, her audiences went to France, dressed in khaki. Right in 1939, when I, when I won the popularity poll with the services overseas in France, and they chose me as their favorite singer, I mean, nobody was more astonished than I was because I, I didn't think I had, and I still don't think I have anything exceptional in, in, in a voice at all. It's, to me, it's just a voice. And, uh, but people obviously found something within it, uh, whether it was the, the way I delivered the song or, or uh, th that began, began to mean so much to them, I don't know. But as a vocal singer, I mean, uh, the, 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 there's nothing special as far as I was concerned. Not when I think of all the wonderful singers there are in the world and these opera voices. They're what I call real singers. <laughs> what comes from her is directly from the heart, directly from the soul. Um, when she sings, it touches you. And it's almost undescribable. You can't teach that. You can go to the best conservatoires in the world. Uh, um, and some people might think that's a bit contentious, but I actually honestly believe that she has that magic quality. She has a great voice, a touching voice, a real voice. She also has th th that paired with amazing diction and this ability to give of herself when she performs. And I think that's why it resonated with, you know, men in the trenches, men in jungles, wherever they were fighting. They felt that they, she was singing just for them. The minute she sang one of her songs, it felt like it was a, a personal dedication, if you like. At the height of the bombing, she was starring at the Palladium. We meet again, don't know when, don't know when. Some 
sunny day. Smiling through, just like you always do. I won't be long. They'll be happy to know that as you saw me go, I was singing this song. We'll meet again. Don't know when. Don't know when. I'd drive up to London and the raids would come and I'd stay in the theatre all night and the bombs would be falling and when it was all clear I would drive home. The BBC brought Vera her biggest audiences, millions of servicemen all over the world listening to her new programme, Sincerely Yours. To our men in uniform from the girls at home. <laughs> a personal letter in words and music and the signature is Sincerely Yours, Vera Lynn. I'd get lots, thousands of letters, yes, every week. And they would be answered and little parcels go off, you know, cigarettes and visit hospitals to see newborn babies and talk about them and say what's going on in London. But apparently this programme was going all over the continent, which I didn't know about. And they were listening to it in haystacks and cellars secretly. She joined ENSA and volunteered to entertain troops in the Far East. When I went to Burma and visited the boys out there and saw the conditions that they were fighting in and the hospitals and, and, and the suffering that they were having, that is when it strikes home to you. Yours till the stars lose their glory. Yours till the birds fail to see. Yours to the end. Even while she was in Burma, her music was still reaching the soldiers, sailors and airmen back home. Apparently, uh, at some camp, they had my uh, record of yours. And some chap got so fed up with hearing this, yours, yours, yours all the time, that he, he thought, I'm going to get rid of this. So he took it out. He got, flew out with it. And whilst throwing it out over the fields, he noticed the, uh, the Bismarck. So the story goes, and uh, this is how they they said they, they, they found that the Bismarck hiding in the fields. But the the, the thing was that when he got back, they were still playing it because they had another record. <laughs> Nowadays, she lives on the South Downs, does her own housework, and looks after a four-acre garden. She's received the OBE, the DBE, the only popular singer to be made a dame. Honorary doctorates, international awards, tribute banquets, twice on This Is Your Life, celebrated and applauded everywhere. She still sings regularly and travels the world, earning millions for charities, particularly the Spastic Society. She won't, but she could, if she wished, enjoy a comfortable and well-deserved retirement, spending more time on her hobbies, sewing and painting. I have given some of them away for sale for charity, you know. Though people say, oh, you ought to put it, you've got enough pictures for an exhibition, but uh, I don't consider them in that category at all, really. I mean, it matters to me if I do something nicer or, or if I make a botch of it, but um, I think when it comes to amateur painting uh, as a hobby, I think if it relaxes you and uh, you get pleasure out of doing it and you finish up with something that's not too bad and you could, you know, you're not ashamed to put it on the wall, then I think that's, uh, you've achieved something, you know. But now the days are short I'm in the autumn of the year 
And when I think of my life Like vintage wine From fine old caves From the brim to the drapes It pours sweet and clear It was a very good year. Each nation, it seems, chooses its sweetheart in its own image. Edith Piaf for France, Doris Day for America, Vera Lynn hits the nerve of British sentimentality, endorsing a view of ourselves which will seem trite to some as a decent, nice, fluent, easygoing island. We like to think that's how we are. There'll always be an England while there's a country lane Wherever there's a cottage small beside a field of grain. One date, one event she'll never miss, the Burma reunion at the Royal Albert Hall. This is its 45th year. That's great. That's Shall right. we go from the top again? If you want. Go from the top and then, we, then we're absolutely firm. Okay. You'll have to have a routine. I like to time things myself. I like to know exactly where my rehearsal is and when I'm going to have lunch and when I'm going to have a little sit down and when I start my makeup and, and when I put my dress on. And uh, after that, once you go on, well, uh, things can be different, you know, it depends on where I am and what kind of a program, whether it's a short program or, or a long one. Songs, there are so many songs from that era, so I'm very lucky. The veterans, diminishing in number, but loyal to the last, arrive by Sharabank. Their campaign medals clinking, their memories as clear as yesterday. Some of the men hadn't been home for even longer than the war because they were on the northwest frontier or somewhere yeah. before that. And she's very loved, and this show wouldn't be possible really without <coughs> her. She brought home to the blokes out in the jungle who were miles from home, the forgotten army, terrible conditions and all of a sudden there was this gem of glamour in the middle of the jungle. Now it wasn't just a performance, it was a piece of home and they've never forgotten it. There will never be anyone, I believe anyway, like Dame Vera again. Um, the whole package, um, someone of great strength, someone of great humility, someone uh, of great pride, someone with a, an amazing voice, amazing diction and a presence that can lift a nation. Um, a lot of elements there. Uh, and to get all of those in one person. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be great singers, I'm sure there'll be uh, great personalities, but to have all of those elements in one person, I can't see that happening again. One always gets apprehensive, you know, the microphone, is it gonna be all right? Is your voice going to be all right? Are you tired or um, do you look all right? That's one of the things you've got to try and keep up in appearance with the boys, you know? They like you to look nice all the time. Thank you very much, everyone. Good evening to you all. How we sing as we glide through the air. Look below, there's our field over there With a full crew aboard And our trust in the Lord We're coming in on
blokes can shut their eyes and they can be back with the, their sweethearts of the forces. You know, they, they can be back in their, their teen years or their early 20s, Absolutely. as the case may be. I mean, she was your girlfriend. And Jimmy will go to sleep in his own little room again. Just you.